Thank you, Millie Edwards. Good morning, welcome to Unity Temple in the Plaza, a place where diversity is praised and peace and harmony are the rewards. For those of you who are watching on uh, DVD or on YouTube, we're in the midst of a uh, thunderstorm here in Kansas City. Many people aren't able to get to church on time, so we're going to pause the service for 30 seconds. <clears throat> Make that 30, 30 minutes. And to best utilize this time, you can um, write a check, uh, <laughs> call in a credit card number. For the next 30 minutes, just think about how you would like to be so generous to Unity Temple. <laughs> okay, we're back after 30 minutes. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> oh, silly, silly, silly. <clears throat> Once again, welcome. I have a few brief announcements before we begin the service this morning. First and foremost, our guest speaker today is Victoria Moran, a dear, dear friend of mine, wonderful author. She uh, started coming to this church when she was five years old, and I believe her nanny would bring her down after attending maybe the Catholic Church or something. But anyway, she's been a wonderful member and a, a dear soul. You'll enjoy what she has to say, and she has many books outside at the table that uh, you can browse over afterwards. We'll now begin the service with the temple chimes, the opening prayer, Geneva Price and the call to worship. Amen. We gather in worship, we gather in prayer, we gather in praise, here is hope. Here is peace, everyone has a part. Here in faith, here in grace, now we lift up our hearts. God is a river that does not run dry. God's faithfulness lifts up like a rising tide we gather in worship we gather in prayer we gather in praise <laughs> people sing. <laughs> don't we always want the gifts we don't have? You know, I was not granted that particular one. I was one of the kids in school when the music teacher would say, you, just move your lips. <laughs> but I do appreciate. I attend Unity Church of New York City at this point. I'm a Kansas City girl. I've been in New York for 12 years. <laughs> yeah, that was something of a manifestation. Have you checked the prices up there? The recession did nothing, nothing. So I guess that means I'm living on an island with a prosperity consciousness. But because everything is so expensive, the Unity Church there has just managed to start the purchasing process of its office space. But we're still renting our sanctuary space. And that's probably why we don't have hymn books. And I'm so glad we don't have hymn books, because that means we don't have to sing. <laughs> and we sing a little bit, you know, for the meditation, you know, take me, use me. And one day, after a really great musical program there at the church, I said to the woman sitting next to me, this music is so incredible. And I particularly appreciate it because I can't carry a tune. She said, yes, I've noticed that. <laughs> so sometimes honesty 
maybe is not completely the best policy. You know, there's honesty about the facts, and then there's honesty about the truth. And I'm finding that it makes a lot of sense in my life if I'm more honest about the truth with the capital T, because those little f facts, they are just changing all the time. And if I base my life on the facts, I get discouraged. When if I base my life on the truth, which are these incredible serendipities that come out of the ever-loving blue, then all this unity stuff starts to make sense. Have you guys noticed that? Works that way. I'm on a book tour. I'm doing eight cities in 11 days, which is sort of fun and sort of awful. And I got on a plane in, in New York City a week ago today, and that used to be fun. Remember when flying was fun? Yeah, calling my talk today, Fly TWA. Who remembers TWA? Late, great Kansas City Airline. TWA, for those of you who don't remember it, was so ubiquitous and so powerful and so covered the world that it was just kind of like, I don't know, Apple. You just assumed that was what you were going to fly. I remember once my mother uh, married a guy in the Air Force. Yes, I remember once she got married. Yes, she got married a few times. But um, <laughs> when she married the guy in the Air Force, she had a cake made for him for his birthday, and she wanted it to have a little plane on it because he was a flyer. So she went to the old Cake Box Bakery. Any memories? Cake Box Bakery. And they did this little tiny plane on the cake, and they'd written in teeny weeny little cake letters, T-W-A. My mother was so upset because this man she was madly in love with was an Air Force flyer, not TWA, and I can remember her taking a toothpick and trying to get rid of those letters as if a man was gonna notice little bitty tiny letters. <laughs> but when I think about flying TWA today, I think about how we fly spiritually, which is with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So I got in that plane a week ago today, and it was cramped, and it was crowded, and you know, I'd gone through the thing at the airport where they kind of flashed your nudity out for all to see to make sure you don't have a concealed bomb. And finally, I'm seated. Thank goodness I have an aisle seat. There are blessings. And there's a man next to me, and there's a woman on his left. Now, I happen to be wearing a button, and I have some out there at the book table, and the button says, I am a Main Street Vegan, because my brand new book is called Main Street Vegan, and it never hurts to advertise and market and get the word out wherever you go. So the woman over here in the window seat leans across the guy and says, what does your button mean? And I told her, and she leaned across again, and she said, I'm a vegan. I've been a vegan for 41 years. Am I reverberating? Do I need to do something? No? OK, then I'll just reverberate like the angelic host. OK, so she said, I've been a vegan for 41 years. And I'm thinking, but you look 45. And she goes on to regale me with how healthy she is, that now she's not only a vegan, but she's mostly a raw food eater, and she's gluten-free, and she exercises two hours a day. I mean, she does live in California. And then she said, <laughs> and I live in Santa Monica, where we actually have a main street. And I said, and I'm from Kansas City, where we actually have a main street which is actually what inspired the title of the book. So we're having this fabulous conversation, and I'm thinking, God is so good. Because even though there are a lot more vegans in the world, for anybody who doesn't know vegans, we're complete vegetarians, and we don't eat anything from an animal. So that's no meat or fish or eggs or dairy or any of that stuff. And we eat all these amazing plants, and it just makes us feel amazing and wonderful and light and sparkly, and we just never age. It's really rather <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> So I'm talking to this woman, and the man in the center is like, 
what did I ever do? <laughs> First, he rolls his eyes, and then he gets out his headphones, and then he just sunk down in his seat and tried to make himself small. So I felt sorry for him, but it was so interesting that there are a lot more vegans than there used to be. We have doubled our numbers since 2009. It's like this fabulous, amazing cult. But we're still only 2.5% of the population. So that means that on that plane with 200 people or so, there were theoretically four of us sprinkled throughout the plane. The idea that one of the four happened to be in the same row as another one of the four that was a God thing. Because that's how I think. Is that how you think? Because if that's how you think, your life is going to have so much more joy and bliss and wonder and beauty than if you just think, coincidence. I don't think anything's a coincidence. I think if it's good, it's a God thing. And if it's bad, it's a God thing I am not recognizing yet. Because if I didn't think like that, I would take this world as the real deal. And that would not be a happy thought. Because this world can be magnificent. And this world can be other than that. So I choose to focus on God. Now, not long ago, I started seeing a hypnotherapist that I found through Groupon. <laughs> Now, it's interesting to think that a hypnotherapist would be such a rationalist, probably an atheist, that she takes everything at face value. Now, I figured this is a good deal. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of Groupons. But after the first time I saw her, I thought, we are just not on the same page. Do you know what she had the audacity to say to me? She said, you see everything mystically. And I said, damn straight. Because <laughs> if you don't see everything mystically, then you have to see it ordinarily. I do not believe that God went to all the trouble to create my soul and put my mother through labor so that I could live ordinarily. <laughs> Note to self, do not find therapists on Groupon. <laughs> because in my very mystical life, amazing, wonderful, fascinating, fabulous things happen all the time. Now, they're not always the amazing, fabulous, mystical, wonderful things that I might want. And that's because I came here to learn stuff. Have you noticed what a big deal this whole weightlifting, bodybuilding thing has become? I mean, I'm seeing these guys and these women, and oh, they look good. In New York City, they're in the subway, and they're wearing these t-shirts that are a couple sizes too small <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> And they got these muscles. Mm. And the shirt says, got kale. <laughs> now, those people go into the gym, and that hurts to lift those weights. You know, that's not fun. It's fun when you leave. But, it hurts to get that weight up over your head. And you know what's happening when you do that? You're tearing down your muscle tissue. You're tearing yourself apart. But in the rebuilding, after the tearing, you grow. And that's what happens to us spiritually. You see, everything in this earth is a metaphor for a spirit, as above, so below. So watch yourself. Watch yourself as you live this life on earth and see what's going on spiritually. So I think that when things are a little bit difficult, that's just a way for me to be in the gym spiritually. So I have teachers. I have spiritual teachers. And what I'm finding at this point in my life is some of them are younger than me. And that is a little bit humbling. 
you know, the first many years of my life, my spiritual teachers were all older, and that seemed like the natural order of things. I used to come to this church, and I would hear L.E. Meyer, and then I would hear Dr. Ernest Wilson, and they seemed really old and really wise, and that was good. I remember when I was 19 years old, I met an amazing woman here in Kansas City. Her name was Gladys Lawler. Is that a familiar name to anybody? Did anybody get the spiritual tutelage of this woman? She had just retired when I met her. She was 65, and I thought that was ancient. And she opened her home to a spiritual library for the theosophical group that was in Kansas City at that time. She was an amazing woman. She lived in a house in a neighborhood that a lot of people had moved away from because it was considered unsafe. Every house on her block had been robbed numerous times. Her house had never been robbed even once because she had this light. She had this connection to the divine. And I knew at age 19, I wanted that. Now maybe without the silver hair, but I wanted the connection. So. I learned from these people, but now a lot of my spiritual teachers are 27. And I was with one of them in Los Angeles just a few days ago. Her name is Rory Friedman, and she's the co-author. Now, pardon me from swearing in church a second time, but the book she wrote was called Skinny Bitch. And most of you, I'm sure, have heard of it because it was a very, very popular book. It was on the New York Times for something like three years. And then it spawned an empire. So they had skinny bitch in the kitchen, skinny bitch with a bun in the oven. I mean, they just, you know, were writing books all over the place. So we went to lunch. And she is one of my teachers because she has manifested something miraculous in this world. She's also a very spiritual young woman. And we were talking about how it happened for her, how she got a phenomenal success right out the chute. You know, she was really, really young when this happened. So what she told me was, you know that for the first year and a half, our book did OK, didn't do great. But then it was photographed in the hands of Victoria Beckham, AKA Posh Spice. And that photograph went viral, and everybody bought the book, and the rest is history. But here's the backstory: Victoria Beckham was not reading that book. Her friend was reading the book. And her friend had to tie her shoe. <laughs> so she handed the book to Posh. The paparazzi appeared, took the photograph, Voila, major success for my young friend and her co-author. Now, my hypnotherapist back in Groupon land would say, pure coincidence, the woman's shoe came untied. I happen to believe an invisible angel from the great beyond bent down, untied that shoe, <laughs> and said, give the book to your friend over here. Because this is how God works. God operates in the realm of delight. The realm of delight. And that's what we have to be open for, whether we're seeing it in the physical or not. And this is the problem that we run into sometimes in New Thought. Because we have the idea that if everything isn't perfect all the time, we're doing something wrong. Well, yes, you did do something wrong. You decided to come here and be human instead of staying there and being angelic. When you decide to come here, you decide to take on a whole lot of stuff because this is a realm of opposites. This is a place where things appear to be good and things appear to be rotten. This is a place where sometimes it's beautiful and sunny and sometimes you get totally soaked and have to borrow a t-shirt from Duke. Who had to borrow a t-shirt from Duke? I heard someone had to do that, yes. So this is Earth and yet, it's so magical because this is where we have more of an opportunity to get to know God. So I said to my young friend, AKA spiritual teacher, what do you do with the whole idea of visualizing what you want versus letting go and letting God? 
versus what some of us know in another teaching would be called praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. She said, well, I visualize, because I figure if it's not God's will, it won't happen anyway. I'm just not that powerful. Sometimes people who are 27 are so wise. So that lunch had some more little mystical stuff involved with it. And that was because the place where we were in Los Angeles was a restaurant called Cafe Gratitude. Now, I've been to Cafe Gratitude before. In fact, the last time I spoke here at Unity back in 2009, I told a Cafe Gratitude story. They brought me my dish. I hadn't paid attention to what it was called. The waiter walked up to me, and he said, you are worthy. <laughs> that was the first time in my life anybody ever told me that. Changed my life because I had to make peace with the worth thing. So I love Cafe Gratitude. I've been to Cafe Gratitude in San Francisco and Berkeley and Marin County and Los Angeles. And now, for anybody who has been living in a cave, there's one in Kansas City. <laughs> now, Cafe Gratitude is way cool because it's vegan, has a lot of raw food, and every single item on the menu is an affirmation. That's why the waiter told me I was worthy, because that was what I ordered. <laughs> So you can go there and think all you're getting is lunch. But you say, let's see, I am grateful. I am grace-filled. I am dazzling. And then you eat it. <laughs> you know communion in the traditional church? That's what that's all about. Communion in the traditional church, depending upon what church it is, means that you're either taking in the symbolic idea of the body of Christ, or if you're Roman Catholic, the actual transfigured substance of the body of Christ. You are taking this into yourself, and it becomes part of your cells, and part of your nature, and part of your being. Now, I always thought communion was kind of an odd concept, because Jesus had said, Every time you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. And I feel like if I go to Cafe Gratitude and I get to eat up, I am dazzling, I am doing that in remembrance of him. And in remembrance of the fact that God lives inside of me, and if I'm not dazzling, it just means that I'm not paying attention. So I love the idea that we can take into ourselves these spiritual ideals. And I also love the fact that we have, what is it, four now vegetarian restaurants in Kansas City? Four or five. I know another one's coming. This is very interesting because do you know, a little bit of trivia in case you're ever on Jeopardy, that the first vegetarian restaurant in the United States that still exists, albeit no longer vegetarian, is the Unity Inn. Charles Fillmore was a big old vegetarian. Who knows that? Now, I have heard people tell me more recently, well, that was one of his eccentricities. He had quite a few. <laughs> well, I belong to this church because I like eccentricities. Because eccentricities in this earth happen to be truths. What doesn't seem normal and the way things are, that's because we're supposed to not be conformed to this world. Now, in the traditional church, they would say, don't be conformed to this world because it's evil. So you're not supposed to like food and sex and money and dressing up and all the things we like the most. It's not that it's evil. It's that it's interesting <laughs> and illusory and changing. This is like the stage setting. This is where we get to be in the play that is our lives. The stage setting isn't the life, but it's where we are now. So when Charles Fillmore said that if we are taking into ourselves every time we eat food, ideas 
attributions of the divine packaged within the physical form, then we need to pay attention to that form. And he said that our food needs to be fresh and bright and radiant. Now, some people would say, it doesn't matter what you eat, because that's just physical and material. Yeah, well, what is physical and material but God in expression? God in expression. So it's really fun when you eat food that helps your spiritual life grow. Now, how can that happen? The yogis talked a lot about that a long time ago, and the Fillmore's studied yoga. You all know that? You know that tower out there at Unity, Unity Village? That is the exact perfect height for meditation according to Hindu tradition. When Swami Vivekananda visited back a long time ago, back in the early 1930s, and he found out what the height was, he said, this is the height. This is the perfect prayer height. Well, Charles and Myrtle just sort of figured, OK, we did it. They did lots of amazing things. What the yogis had to say about food was that what we take in becomes us. And they figured if meditation is the way to get to know God, then you want to do everything you can to make meditation easy. And one of the things they decided was you can eat food that makes meditation easy. So they looked at food, and they said, let's see. If you are eating food that is stale and old and dead, food that doesn't have any life force in it, and they said that would include alcohol, that would include meat, that would include things that are aged, like fermented food, too much alcohol. It just makes you this tired. <sighs> and, and people that are attracted to the food that's just really processed and really dead and comes out of a package, they're just not going to be real interested in, in meditation and prayer and higher thought. And when you think about today, the kind of food they put in institutions and prisons, it's kind of that kind of food. The yogis call that tamasic. And then they said, over here on the other side, there's this other kind of food, and it will pick you up and pump you up. And what it is is lots of stimulation, and we've got coffee, coffee, coffee. And if you go to Starbucks, you want to get a venti and get extra, extra shots, because that will pump you up. And maybe you drink tea, and maybe you want to make it really, 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 really caffeinated. Caffeine is the ayahuasca of the 21st century. And then there's also food that is highly, highly stimulating because it's really, really spiced. It's really, really salty. It's really, really fried. It's really, really sweet. It's going to get you going. They call those foods rajasic. And they said, well, let's see. If you're eating this stuff, you're going to fall asleep if you try to meditate. Eat this stuff, can't sit still. So somewhere in the middle, there's this beautiful, beautiful guna that they call sattvic. And the foods that fall under the sattvic classification, according to the ancient yogis, were fruits and vegetables and grains and beans nuts and seeds, and at that time they said, milk from healthy cows. I don't think we have a lot of healthy cows these days. Probably no karma-free milk, as the yogis would say. So they've given us this wonderful idea that we might wish to draw from. Charles Fillmore, Myrtle Fillmore, wished to draw from that. And now it's easier and easier to dabble. Just try it. Try a little bit. Try a meatless Monday. Try a vegan till 5 p.m. Try one day at a time. I love that idea. That's how the alcoholics sober up in AA. So you can do it with food. I'm not going to eat animal food or junk food just for today. Doesn't matter what I eat at my sister's wedding next June. It's not June yet. Doesn't matter what I eat when I go to Argentina on vacation in 2014 because I'm not doing that yet. It's just today. You can do anything from morning till night if you're connected to the higher power that makes all things possible. 
There was a wonderful spiritual teacher who lived in India for many years. He passed away a few years ago, but that makes no difference whatsoever. His name was Sai Baba, and I've talked to some of his devotees, and I say, how does your relationship with Sai Baba differ now that he is no longer in the physical body? And they say, it doesn't differ. What does it matter? Whether we're expressing in this form or expressing elsewhere, when you have a great big soul, it just covers everything. Now, I went to India, and I went to Sai Baba's ashram, and for the first time ever in my entire life, I saw an aura. I love seeing things for myself. Y'all have heard of auras. We've all seen the halos on the medieval paintings, and we've seen pictures. If you're in the New Age stuff, you know you're supposed to have these colors around yourself. I'd never seen that, so I sort of believed it existed, because people I trusted said it did. But when I saw Sai Baba, I saw one with my very own eyes. He had this light that came from his little tiny physical body and went all up into forever. So of course, the fact that that body is gone doesn't mean a thing, except that maybe that light is extending even further. Now, one of the things that made Sai Baba famous was that he could materialize stuff from the atmosphere. He would materialize a stuff called the booty, which was a sacred ash that people would use for healing. And sometimes he would materialize trinkets of various kinds for his devotees so that they would have something with his energy that they could take with them. Now, of course, I looked at all this with Western skepticism. I mean, huh, making stuff out of nothing. I think you could do that in Las Vegas and have a pretty decent act. And yet, there's more to heaven and earth, Horatio, than any of us has dreamed of. One of Sai Baba's followers was a Christian person, Anglican, English gentleman, and he was out walking one day with Baba, and he said, I've been a follower of yours for a really long time. It's really enriched my life. And not to be greedy or anything, but you've never materialized anything for me. And Baba said, oh, all right, I will. So he did this thing that he did to materialize stuff, and nothing happened. And they stood. And they waited, and the Englishman was getting a little bit uncomfortable and wanted to say, don't worry about it, it'll be OK. But they waited. And after several minutes, Baba handed his follower a beautiful wooden cross. He took it. He said, oh my goodness, this is exquisite. I'll keep this all my life. But I have to ask you something. Usually, you materialize stuff in an instant. Why did this take so long? And Baba said, well, it took some doing to get wood from the original cross. That's how it is sometimes in our lives. You see, it's coming. This thing you want, or some variation on what you want that is better than what you want, is coming. If you're in a relationship with your own true love, and it's working out pretty well except when the other person is irritating. <laughs> Think about the day before you met this person. You didn't know if you'd ever meet them. You didn't know if you'd always be alone. But within 24 hours, they showed up. And now you have them. Love, beauty, joy, and irritation, all in this perfect package. <laughs> Coming down the pike, just like that person that you may be with today, and God bless you if you are, is everything that you're dreaming of, everything that you're envisioning, everything that you're holding dear. It's not necessarily coming in the time that you want it. Who's taken the 4T class here at Unity or somewhere else? Now, I took a 4T class back in 19, 
96. And I almost flunked. I mean, my life is just not going well. 4T, if, for those of you who don't know, it's about manifesting your dreams. And you're supposed to manifest your dreams within the class period, which is 12 weeks. And you're supposed to say, this is my dream, and this is the date that I want my dream to happen. That's never quite set right with me. Because I'm me, and God is God. But I was doing the thing. And I said, this is my dream, and this is my date. And the date came, and the date went, and everybody else got their dream, and I didn't. But six weeks later, I did. I sold a book for a whole lot of money. A year and a half later, I went on Oprah with that book. There, thanks. There was a time gap in between wanting that and when it happened. There was probably a time gap in between your wanting a life partner and having all the forces of the universe converge so that you showed up at the same Starbucks. This is how it works. The trick is to align your thoughts, your words, and your actions with the way God would think and speak and live if he were living on earth, because he is. He's living in you, and through you, and as you. You don't want to disconnect from the Creator by taking too much of your ideas of what's real from the creation. Those are the facts. They change. God is the truth. It never changes. What you want, what you're about, what you aspire to, what you dream of, is in process. Between now and when it's in the material world, just be happy. Go have lunch at Cafe Gratitude. Spend some time with your friends today. Enjoy your life. Lift some weights. And before you know it, what looked like a miracle is the reality of your life. That's how it works. God bless you. Thank you.